Law 40. Despise the free lunch. Judgment. What is offered for free is dangerous. It usually involves either a trick or a hidden obligation. What has worth is worth paying for. By paying your own way, you stay clear of gratitude, guilt, and deceit. It is also often wise to pay the full price. There is no cutting corners with excellence. Be lavish with your money and keep it circulating, for generosity is a sign and a magnet for power. Money and Power In the realm of power, everything must be judged by its cost, and everything has a price. What is offered for free or at bargain rates often comes with a psychological price tag. Complicated feelings of obligation, compromises with quality, the insecurity those compromises bring, on and on. The powerful learn early to protect their most valuable resources, independence and room to maneuver. By paying the full price, they keep themselves free of dangerous entanglements and worries. Being open and flexible with money also teaches the value of strategic generosity, a variation on the old trick of giving when you are about to take. By giving the appropriate gift, you put the recipient under obligation. Generosity softens people up to be deceived. By gaining a reputation for liberality, you win people's admiration while distracting them from your power plays. By strategically spreading your wealth, you charm the other courtiers, creating pleasure and making valuable allies. Look at the masters of power, the Caesars, the Queen Elizabeths, the Michelangelos, the Medicis, not a miser among them. Even the great con artists spend freely to swindle. Tight purse strings are unattractive. When engaged in seduction, Casanova would give completely, not only of himself, but of his wallet. The powerful understand that money is psychologically charged, and that it is also a vessel of politeness and sociability. They make the human side of money a weapon in their armory. For everyone able to play with money, thousands more are locked in a self-destructive refusal to use money creatively and strategically. These types represent the opposite pole to the powerful, and you must learn to recognize them, either to avoid their poisonous natures or to turn their inflexibility to your advantage. The Greedy Fish The greedy fish take the human side out of money, Cold and ruthless, they see only the lifeless balance sheet, viewing others solely as either pawns or obstructions in their pursuit of wealth. They trample on people's sentiments and alienate valuable allies. No one wants to work with the greedy fish, and over the years they end up isolated, which often proves their undoing. The Bargain Demon Powerful people judge everything by what it costs, not just in money, but in time, dignity, and peace of mind. And this is exactly what bargain demons cannot do. Wasting valuable time digging for bargains, they worry endlessly about what they could have gotten elsewhere for a little less. On top of that, the bargain item they do buy is often shabby. Perhaps it needs costly repairs, or will have to be replaced twice as fast as a high-quality item. The costs of these pursuits, not always in money, though the price of a bargain is often deceptive, but in time and peace of mind, discourage normal people from undertaking them. But for the bargain demon, the bargain is an end in itself. These types might seem to harm only themselves, but their attitudes are contagious, Unless you resist them, they will infect you with the insecure feeling that you should have looked harder to find a cheaper price. Don't argue with them or try to change them. Just mentally add up the cost in time and inner peace, if not in hidden financial expense, of the irrational pursuit of a bargain. 
the sadist. Financial sadists play vicious power games with money as a way of asserting their power. They might, for example, make you wait for money that is owed you, promising that the check is in the mail. Or, if they hire you to work for them, they meddle in every aspect of the job, haggling and giving you ulcers. Sadists seem to think that paying for something gives them the right to torture and abuse the seller. They have no sense of the courtier element in money. If you are unlucky enough to get involved with this type, accepting a financial loss may be better in the long run than getting entangled in their destructive power games. The Indiscriminate Giver Generosity has a definite function in power. It attracts people, softens them up, makes allies out of them. But it has to be used strategically with a definite end in mind. Indiscriminate givers, on the other hand, are generous because they want to be loved and admired by all, and their generosity is so indiscriminate and needy that it may not have the desired effect. If they give to one and all, why should the recipient feel special? Attractive as it may seem to make an indiscriminate giver your mark, in any involvement with this type, you will often feel burdened by their insatiable emotional needs. Transgression of the Law In the early 18th century, no one stood higher in English society than the Duke and Duchess of Marlborough. The Duke, having led successful campaigns against the French, was considered Europe's premier general and strategist, and his wife, the Duchess, after much maneuvering, had established herself as the favorite of Queen Anne, who became ruler of England in 1702. In 1704, the Duke's triumph at the Battle of Blenheim made him the toast of England, and to honor him, the Queen awarded him a large plot of land in the town of Woodstock, and the funds to create a great palace there. Calling his planned home the Palace of Blenheim, the Duke chose as his architect the young John Van Brew, a kind of Renaissance man who wrote plays as well as designed buildings. And so construction began in the summer of 1705, with much fanfare and great hopes. Van Brew had a dramatist's sense of architecture. His palace was to be a monument to Marlborough's brilliance and power, and was to include artificial lakes, enormous bridges, elaborate gardens, and other fantastical touches. From day one, however, the Duchess could not be pleased. She thought Van Brew was wasting money on yet another stands of trees. She wanted the palace finished as soon as possible. The Duchess tortured Van Brew and his workmen on every detail. She was consumed with petty matters, although the government was paying for Blenheim. She counted every penny. Eventually, her grumbling about Blenheim and other things, too, created an irreparable rift between her and Queen Anne, who, in 1711, dismissed her from the court, ordering her to vacate her apartments at the royal palace. When the Duchess left, fuming over the loss of her position and also of her royal salary, she emptied the apartment of every fixture down to the brass doorknobs. Over the next ten years, work on Blenheim would stop and start, as the funds became harder to procure from the government. The Duchess thought Van Brew was out to ruin her. She quibbled over every carload of stone and bushel of lime, counted every extra yard of iron railing or foot of wainscot, hurling abuse at the wasteful workmen, contractors, and surveyors. Marlborough, old and weary, wanted nothing more than to settle into the palace in his last years, but the project became bogged down in a swamp of litigation, the workmen suing the Duchess for wages, the Duchess suing the architect right back. In the midst of this interminable wrangling, the Duke died. He had never spent a night in his beloved Blenheim. After Marlborough's death, it became clear that he had a vast estate, worth over two million pounds, more than enough to pay for finishing the palace. But the Duchess would not relent. 
she held back Van Brew's wages as well as the workman's, and finally had the architect dismissed. The man who took his place finished Blenheim in a few years, following Van Brew's designs to the letter. Van Brew died in 1726, locked out of the palace by the Duchess, unable to set foot in his greatest creation. Foreshadowing the Romantic movement, Blenheim had started a whole new trend in architecture, but had given its creator a 20-year nightmare. Interpretation For the Duchess of Marlborough, money was a way to play sadistic power games. She saw the loss of money as a symbolic loss of power. With Van Brew, her contortions went deeper still. He was a great artist, and she envied his power to create, to attain a fame outside her reach. She may not have had his gifts, but she did have the money to torture and abuse him over the pettiest details, to ruin his life. This kind of sadism, however, bears an awful price. It made construction that should have lasted ten years take twenty. It poisoned many a relationship, alienated the Duchess from the court, deeply pained the Duke, who wanted only to live peacefully in Blenheim, created endless lawsuits, and took years off Van Brew's life. Finally, too, posterity had the last word. Van Brew is recognized as a genius, while the Duchess is forever remembered for her consummate cheapness. The powerful must have grandeur of spirit. They can never reveal any pettiness. And money is the most visible arena in which to display either grandeur or pettiness. Best spend freely, then, and create a reputation for generosity, which in the end will pay great dividends. Never let financial details blind you to the bigger picture of how people perceive you. The resentment will cost you in the long run, and if you want to meddle in the work of creative people under your hire, at least pay them well. Your money will buy their submission better than your displays of power. <laughs>